if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we all watched in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Don't you think it's strange? There were no fighter jets. Did someone give the order not to intercept? And if they really scrambled Then why'd they fly so slow? Maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know And where was our president? George W. That fool he was visiting with children at an elementary school And when he heard the news He didn't seem concerned He just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned The Bushes and Bin Ladens Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded They flew his family out Osama got his training From the CIA Our soldiers took Afghanistan They let him slip away A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9-11 attack? If you get your views from television news You'll only hear stories that corporations choose You'll only get to see what they want you to see You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe Hello and welcome to episode 14, I guess it is. No, episode 15 of Omega Presents. Today's going to be a good show. I actually did some preparation. I think you'll like that. Uh, but first, here's a disclaimer that uh, I'm going to put on my show in honor of Ace Hayes, who had the secret government seminar, if any of you have seen that. Uh, the following program contains material that may be objectionable to the ruling elites and their puppet government, to those who enrich themselves obscenely while plundering the world and oppressing its people, and to those whose biggest fear is the exercise of actual democracy by the American people and all other people.
And that being said, we'll hope that we offend that type of person with this show, because truth often offends. But before I go much farther, we got an announcement to make. The time schedule is changing. This is the last show of the spring season, and we're going to be uh, moving on into the summer season with a slightly different schedule, easier to remember, first and third Saturdays of the month. And it'll be at 5 o'clock, same channel, channel 11. Instead of 3 o'clock, 5 o'clock. But here's the cool part. You probably heard this last week. We're going to uh, be in the bigger studio, so we're going to have a live studio audience starting on the 19th. That'll be the, the first actual studio production in that studio. Uh, we're going to have the Portland 9-11 Truth, uh, PDX 9-11 Truth movement meet here in the studio for a live television meeting at least once a month, maybe twice a month. But uh, that'll be kind of a fun thing. But next week, the studios are closed. That's when we start. Instead of waiting two weeks, we're going to actually go next week on the 5th. Uh, so I already prepared a video. Uh, it's a one-hour uh, David Ray Griffin, the last half of 9-11, the myth and the reality. It's a great video and um, well worth watching. Set your tape recorders. But that'll be Saturday, 5 p.m., Channel 11, next Saturday. So, uh, and with that, there's a clip that I got from Keith Olbermann on Countdown. Uh, maybe you already saw it, but uh, it's a, a great clip where he tells it like it is about George Bush, our president. Now, that, this is a show about 9-11 being an inside job, and, you know, George Bush, at best, was you know, just a, a mole. He wasn't one of the the henchmen. His his job was just to kind of keep things going on the periphery. Smush Bush. But anyway, so he's not a, that important a player, but let's go into the video, and then I'll follow up after that with some more information. I've got the uh, articles of impeachment that are 9-11 related. So my crew, roll that video. Part of what I will say was said here first on January 31st. Unfortunately, it is both sadder and truer now than it was then. Who's to blame, Mr. Bush also said this afternoon. Look, these folks in Congress passed a good bill late last summer. The problem is they let the bill expire. My attitude is if the bill was good enough then, why not pass the bill again? You know, like the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution or Executive Order 9066 or the Alien and Sedition Acts or slavery. Mr. Bush, you say that our ability to track terrorist threats will be weakened and our citizens will be in greater danger, yet you have weakened that ability. You have subjected us, your citizens, to that greater danger. This, Mr. Bush, is simple enough even for you to understand. For the moment, at least, thanks to some true patriots in the House and to your own stubbornness, you have tabled telecom immunity and the FISA Act. You, by your own terms and your own definitions, you have just sided with the terrorists. You got to have this law or we're all going to die. But practically speaking, you vetoed the law. It is bad enough, sir, that you were demanding an ex post facto law, which could still clear the AT&Ts and the Verizons from responsibility for their systematic, aggressive, and blatant collaboration with your illegal and unjustified spying on Americans under this flimsy guise of looking for any terrorists who might be stupid enough to make a collect call or send a mass email. But when you demanded it again during the State of the Union address, you wouldn't even confirm that they'd actually done anything for which they deserved to be cleared. The Congress must pass liability protection for companies believed to have assisted in the efforts to defend America. Believed? Don't you know? Don't you even have the guts Dick Cheney showed in admitting they did collaborate with you? Does this endless presidency of loopholes and even fine print extend here too? If you believe in the seamless mutuality of government and big business, come out and say it. There is a dictionary definition, one word that describes that toxic blend. You're a fascist. Get them to print you a t-shirt with fascist on it. What else is this but fascism? Did you see Mark Klein on this newscast last November? Mark Klein was the AT&T whistleblower, the one who explained in the placid and dull terms of your local neighborhood IT desk how he personally attached all AT&T circuits, 
everything, carrying every one of your phone calls, every one of your emails, every bit of your web browsing into a secure room, room number 641A at the Folsom Street facility in San Francisco, where it was all copied so the government could look at it. Not some of it, not just the international part of it, certainly not just the stuff that some spy, a spy both patriotic and telepathic, might able to divine had been sent or spoken by or to a terrorist. Everything. Every time you looked at a naked picture, every time you bid on eBay, every time you phoned in a donation to a Democrat, my thought was, Mr. Klein told us last November, George Orwell's 1984. And here I am, forced to connect the Big Brother machine. If there's one thing we know about Big Brother, Mr. Bush, it's that he, well, you, are a liar. This Saturday at midnight, you said today, legislation authorizing intelligence professionals to quickly and effectively monitor terrorist communications will expire. If Congress does not act by that time, our ability to find out who the terrorists are talking to, what they are saying, and what they are planning will be compromised. You said that the lives of countless Americans depend on you getting your way. This is crap. And you sling it with an audacity and a speed unrivaled even by the greatest political felons of our history. Richard Clark, you might remember him, sir. He was one of the counter-terror pros which you inherited from President Clinton before you ran the professionals out of government in favor of your unreality-based reality. Richard Clark wrote in the Philadelphia Inquirer, Let me be clear. Our ability to track and monitor terrorists overseas would not cease should the Patriot or Protect America Act rather expire. If this were true, the president would not threaten to terminate any temporary extension with his veto pen. All surveillance currently occurring would continue even after legislative provisions lapsed because authorizations issued under the act are in effect up to a full year. You are a liar, Mr. Bush. And after showing some skill at it initially, you have ceased to even be a very good liar. And your minions, like John Boehner, your Republican congressional crash dummies, who just happen to decide to walk out of Congress when a podium full of microphones await them, they should just keep walking out of Congress, and if possible, out of the country. For they, sir, and you, sir, have no place in a government of the people, by the people, for the people. A lot of you are the symbolic descendants of the despotic middle managers of some banana republic to whom freedom is an ironic brand name, a word you reach for when you want to get away with its opposite. Thus, Mr. Bush, your panoramic invasion of privacy is dressed up as protecting America. Thus, Mr. Bush, your indiscriminate domestic spying becomes the focused monitoring only of terrorist communications. Thus, Mr. Bush, what you and the telecom giants have done isn't unlawful. It's just the kind of perfectly legal, passionately patriotic thing for which you happen to need immunity. Richard Clark is on the money as usual. That the president was willing to veto this eavesdropping means there is no threat to the legitimate counter-terror efforts still underway. As Senator Kennedy reminded us in December, the president has said that American lives will be sacrificed if Congress does not change FISA. But he has also said that he will veto any FISA bill that does not grant retroactive immunity. No immunity, no FISA bill. So, if we take the president at his word, he's willing to let Americans die to protect the phone companies. And that literally cannot be. Even Mr. Bush could not overtly take a step that actually aids the terrorists. I'm not talking about ethics here. I'm talking about blame. If the president seems to be throwing the baby out with the bathwater, it means we can safely conclude there is no baby. Because if there were, sir, now that you have vetoed an extension of the eavesdropping, if some terrorist attack were to follow, you would not merely be guilty of siding with the terrorists. You would not merely be guilty of prioritizing the telecoms over the people. You would not merely be guilty of stupidity. You would not merely be guilty of treason, sir. You would be personally and eternally responsible. And if there is one thing we know about you, Mr. Bush, one thing you have proved time and time again, it is that you are never responsible. As recently ago as 2006, we spoke words like these with trepidation. The idea that even the most cynical and untrustworthy of the politicians in our history, George W. Bush, would use the literal form of terrorism against his own people was dangerous territory. It seemed to tempt fate, to heighten fear. We will not fear any longer. We will not fear the international terrorists. We will thwart them. We will not fear the recognition of the manipulation of our yearning for safety. We will call that what it is, terrorism. We will not fear identifying the vulgar hypocrites in our government. We will name them. 
and we will not fear George W. Bush, nor will we fear because George W. Bush wants us to fear. Night countdown's worst persons in the world. The bronze to coltergeist went on fixed news and called Senator Obama, quote, B. Hussein Obama five times. The host asked her why she was calling him that, and he mentioned it then a sixth time. Then she referred to him as President Hussein. Then we put her on this network today so she could do it again. For the record, if you want to try her trick and call her by her first initial and her middle name, it's close. Her middle initial is H, but she'd only be A. Hart Coulter. <laughs> Runner-up Laura Ingram reporting on her radio show that the president had, quote, Welcome to Al Sharpton to the White House. I hope they nailed down all the valuables. And adding, quote, I can't believe they let him in the front door there at Black History Month. I know you and Coulter think you're satirists, but you do realize that if you're really not racist, you are enabling racism there. But our winner, Tom Sullivan, who apparently does a show for fixed radio, when a caller suggested that Senator Obama's speeches reminded him of the speeches of Adolf Hitler, Sullivan then alternated clips from a Hitler speech and an Obama speech, played them consecutively on national radio. When another caller said it was unacceptable to compare Obama to Hitler, Sullivan said he wasn't. He was just noting, quote, Adolf Hitler was able to gather a country of people and get them excited about whatever it was that he was talking to them about. He was a very fiery, enigmatic, and I asked the guy, I said, are you saying that Obama is like Hitler? And he said, no, it's the speaking style, that's all. And the speaking style is actually kind of similar. So you're not comparing Obama to Hitler, but you are comparing Obama's speaking style to Hitler's speaking style. So you're insisting you're not comparing them in any way, except when you are comparing them in that way. Tom Sullivan of Fox Noise Radio, today's worst person in the world! All right, yeah, that last part wasn't exactly on track, but it was a funny deal. It was part of the clip, so just let it play through. I, but uh, the reason I'm talking about George Bush, we've... 9-11 was an inside job planned by the people around George Bush. George Bush, if you refer to uh, right here, this 9-11 uh, synthetic terror by Webster Tarpley, he'll explain uh, exactly how that works, but turn to the chapter called Angel is Next. That's the, the code name. Angel is the code name for the airplane the president was on maybe all the time, but anyway, during the 9-11 thing, uh, the, the, the people behind the plot let President Bush know that he had to uh, either go along with the, with the plan or Angel is next. After four planes hit three out of four targets, maybe there was another plane coming for George. And anyway, that explains his sudden reversal. Remember before 9-11, he was talking about being, uh, you know, not, not going around the world and throwing his weight around and just a total reversal after 9-11 and it's basically you go along with the plan or you're out but uh, I bet you haven't heard the articles of impeachment, of impeachment against uh, our president Dennis Kucinich uh, introduced 35 articles of impeachment on June 9th it took him 5 hours to read them and I'm going to read them to you of course, we don't have five hours. I have a synopsis here. I'm going to start at the end, 35, because they're the 9-11 related ones. Okay, Article 35, endangering the health of 9-11 responders. The president recklessly endangered the health of 9-11 responders by causing and allowing the Environmental Protection Agency to issue false, unsubstantiated, and misleading information about the air quality in the area after the attacks. Number 34, obstructing the 9-11 investigation. The president first attempted to prevent all investigation into the 9-11 attacks. You probably remember that. It took 411 days before the first investigation began. After that time, it was getting pretty cold. Most investigations start within a week, you know, or less. The, anyway, uh, number 33, ignoring the warnings about 9-11. 
The president failed to take proper steps to protect the nation prior to the 9-11 attacks by ignoring repeated warnings from his top security advisors regarding the likely imminence of a terrorist attack. In other words, the people planning all this had, you know, had their patsies. Remember, there's patsies, moles, and then the, the killer elite. And the moles are the ones like President Bush and probably Dick Cheney, whose job is to you know, make sure that the patsies don't get arrested before the, uh, the crime. And they, but they have to be visible enough so people know that they're there so that they can, you know, have a likely excuse to arrest them, just like they did with the 19 Arab terrorists that they claim piloted the, the planes into the 9-11 towers, the World Trade Center towers. Anyway, uh, number 32, deception involving global climate change. The president has manipulated scientific information and otherwise deceived the public and Congress with regard to the grave danger to citizens' health and security posed by global climate change. Yeah, they just had a security uh, analysis that for the first time considered global climate change as a severe threat to our security uh, for lots of different reasons. 31, failure to prepare for and to respond to Hurricane Katrina. The president failed to re prepare for the predicted Hurricane Katrina disaster. He failed to respond to the dire need of which he had been informed and has now failed to rebuild the destroyed areas. Number 30. And remember, every one of these by itself is sufficient to impeach. Deception on Medicare. The president has championed policies and legislation designed to cripple Medicare and has deceived the public and Congress about the cost and effects of his administration's Medicare bill. Number 29, the Voting Acts, Voting Rights Act violation. The president has conspired to willfully corrupt and manipulate the electoral process of the United States in connection with the 2004 and 2006 elections. Don't forget the 2002 election, but he, the president might not have been involved in that, just as his cronies and maybe his dad. Who knows? Anyway, so that's 29. We don't have too many more to go. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Number 28, undermining free and fair elections. The president has conspired to undermine free and fair elections by obstructing and interfering with the Justice Department's independence in legal oversight of elections. 27, noncompliance with congressional subpoenas. The president has repeatedly caused his current and former agents and subordinates to refuse to comply with congressional subpoenas. That was what got Nixon uh, basically impeached. Those were articles of impeachment passed by the House. He resigned before the Senate got to consider it. Um, violating laws via signing statements. Maybe you heard about the over 800 signing statements that he's tacked on to legal legislation. The president has repeatedly used signing statements to announce that he intends to violate the very laws he is signing, and then he has, in fact, violated those laws. Number 25, illegal database of private info information. The president has illegally arranged with the telecommunications companies to create a large database containing information regarding American citizens' private telephone calls and emails. 24, illegal spying. The president has intentionally authorized and encouraged illegal electronic surveillance on American citizens. 23, military domestic law enforcement. The president is, has illegally established programs to use the military in domestic law enforcement in violation of the Posse Comitatus. 22, creating secret laws. The president has requested opinions from the Justice Department Office of Legal Counsel then hid them from the public by abusing his power to classify state secrets, thereby creating, in effect, a body of secret laws. Number 21, deception, Iran, and threat. The president is misleading Congress and the American people about the threat of a nuclear attack from Iran. He's not misleading. He just be, they're just being too polite in this. He's lying. <laughs> anyway, 20, imprisoning children. Yeah, we don't do that in the United States, right? Well, thanks to George Bush and his group, we are now a nation that imprisons and tortures children. Yeah, 
And our, you, did you happen to see the interrogation of you? Not you, but attorney you from the Justice Department who was more or less responsible for pinning all of the torture uh, documents. And he, you know, he's more than willing to talk almost any time and try to make him stop. Well, the way you make him stop is by asking him under oath in front of Congress, and then he doesn't give you any answers. Well, anyway, the president has authorized or permitted the arrest and detention as enemy combatants in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Guantanamo Bay of at least 2,500 children under the age of 18, including some as young as 10 years old. We send them to Guantanamo to be tortured in front of their parents. It's, uh, it, it, it's just amazing that how could we sit here for seven years watching our country t be turned into everything they told us that was good, uh, uh, I mean, bad about Russia, and we were good because we were different from all that. You know, and here I grow up to be a uh, disillusioned adult to find out that every word they said was a lie. We are the world's leading torturers. Anyway, that's just disgusting, and we can do something about it. Number 19, kidnapping. The president has secretly authorized and encouraged the illegal kidnapping and transport of persons to nations known to practice torture. They call that uh, extraordinary rendition. That's another buzzword for illegal kidnapping. 18, torture. The president has secretly authorized and encouraged the use of torture against captives. 17. Illegal detentions. The president has detained indefinitely and without charges both U.S. citizens and foreign captives. 16. Fraud and waste in the Iraq contracts. The president has recklessly facilitated and allowed fraud and waste of billions of U.S. tax dollars paid for no-bid, cost-plus contracts to associates of executive branch officials for military needs and construction in Iraq and has stymied investigations into such fraud and waste. Number 15, immunizing contractors in Iraq. The president has established policies immunizing U.S. contractors from criminal prosecution in violation of his obligations under international and U.S. law. 14, misprison of felony. Look that one up, misprison, that's a word. The president facilitated the exposure of classified information about former covert CIA operative Valerie Plame Wilson and the subsequent cover-up of that illegal activity. 13. Secret Energy Task Force. The president created a secret task force to guide U.S. energy and military policy and then thwarted attempts to investigate that policy. Remember Ken Lay, the CEO of Enron? He had an office in George Bush's White House and he had the secret meetings with Cheney to develop our energy policy. Isn't that nice to know Enron has been, you know, helping us through our economic problems all along. Well, anyway, 12, initiating of war for oil. The president invaded Iraq for the purpose of oil, in part seizing control of its oil. 11, illegal permanent bases. The president has illegally used public funds to construct permanent U.S. military bases in Iraq. Yeah, well, I thought there were only four of them. But now that he's pushing for 50 permanent military bases, it comes out that we've already built 30 of them. How about that? Okay, number 10. We're on the top 10 now. False military stories. Remember Pat Tillman and Jessica Lynch? Yep, the president has promoted false propaganda about U.S. military deaths and injuries, including those of specialist Pat Tillman and Private Jessica Lynch. I've got a good video of the filming of the Jessica Lynch rescue. I can put that away too soon. The, you know, they did several takes, and the people in the hospital cooperated with them. It was just ridiculous. But anyway, um, let's see, where was I? Um, Endangering, number nine, endangering troops. The president has knowingly endangered U.S. troops by failing to provide available body armor and vehicular armor. Number eight, unprovoked war. The president has directed an unprovoked attack against Iraq and, don't forget, uh, Afghanistan. That's another unprovoked attack. 
um, without UN authorization. Number seven, undeclared war. The president invaded Iraq without a congressional declaration of war. Remember, only the House of Representatives can declare war. Not the Senate, not the president, just the House of Representatives. Number six, unauthorized war. The president has exceeded his constitutional authority to wage war by invading Iraq without meeting the requirements of Congress's authorization to use military force. Number five, illegal misspending. The president has secretly and without notice to Congress used funds appropriated for Afghanistan to prepare to invade Iraq. In other words, rob Ahmed to pay Hamas, or I don't know. I, I can't come up with a good joke. Sorry. Anyway, um, number four, deception of the Iraq and threat. The president has executed a wide-ranging strategy to deceive the public into believing that Iraq posed an imminent threat or any kind of threat at all. You know, calling Iraq a threat of any kind back then when Saddam was in power was, again, remember Keith Olbermann? talking to the president, you, sir, are a liar. Well, that's exactly it. Iraq was never a threat, not even to its own neighbors. <laughs> and number two, deception, Iraq and 9-11. The president executed a calculated strategy to mislead the public and Congress into believing that Iraq was connected to the 9-11 attacks. Now, you know, there are still people to this day that think that Iraq and Saddam and Afghanistan had something to do with it. The Afghanistan war was already a signed order on the president's desk on 9-1-0, 9-10. That means that uh, it didn't have anything to do with 9-11, but 9-11 was the justification. And number one, it's been in the news lately, secret propaganda. The president has illegally spent public dollars on a secret propaganda campaign to manufacture a false case for war hiring reporters to do false reports as if they were doing news, and hiring 75 retired generals to, you know, give the story the way the, the president wants it told. It's time that we stopped letting the government get away with it. You know, it's been a long, long time since we've had a constitutional government. But, you know, we have the power because we are many and they are few, even though they're the best armed, if we ever had a, you know, a real decision to return our country to truth and justice, the, uh, the military, they're part of us. You know, they're not just under control of the elites. They're also members of families of your friends and relatives. And, you know, they would eventually realize, you know, which side they really are on. And I don't think that 1,500 corporations are enough to, uh, you know, control 300 million people. That's just in our country. Well, I've, I've got a 9-11 quickie to, video to show you. It's um, called Reopen the 9-11. And it's about seven minutes long, and it does a really good job of going through most of the stuff we've talked about just as a kind of a quickie refresher. And then I'll be back to, to talk about some more and show you a real special video. So let's see if they can, yeah, here it comes. September 11, 2001, nearly 3,000 innocent Americans were intentionally murdered. Over 1,000 soldiers have died and thousands more have been maimed or wounded. We dedicate this video to their memory and to the capture trial and punishment of those responsible. Please join us in a prayer or moment of silence in tribute to them. In its final report, the 9-11 Commission ignored the following significant facts and questions that conflict with that report's conclusions. Why did a third skyscraper at the World Trade Center that was not hit inexplicably collapse? Building 7 at the World Trade Center was never hit by an airplane and had no significant fire. It was 47 stories high. It was constructed of steel. Yet at 5.30 p.m. it fell perfectly straight down into a small pile of rubble, just like a controlled demolition. Why did the Federal Emergency Management Agency lament that 
The specifics of the fires in World Trade Center 7 and how they caused the building to collapse remain unknown. Larry Silverstein, the leaseholder of Building 7 who collected insurance of $7 billion, is on tape saying he ordered the New York Fire Department to pull it, to destroy the building with explosives. In October of 2001, Scientific American told us that they just don't build them as tough as the World Trade Center. Considering that Meridian Plaza in Philadelphia burned fiercely for 19 hours yet never collapsed, how could the South Tower at the World Trade Center fall after burning less than one hour? How could the North Tower fall after burning only for two? How could the jet fuel have caused the collapse when the Federal Emergency Management and other government agencies have stated that most of the jet fuel was gone in the initial fireball? Moreover, how could the fires have caused the collapse at all, since recent fire tests by Cardington found that a steel building survived fires in experiments with extreme temperatures beyond the range possible with jet fuel? Since the black smoke coming from the buildings means that the fire was oxygen-starved and could not have reached its maximum temperature of 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, and steel melts at a much higher temperature of 2500 degrees Fahrenheit, nearly 700 degrees hotter than the maximum temperature of the fire, how could cleanup crews have found melted steel in the basements? How could, days later, NASA satellite images show hot spots in the buildings that still exceeded the maximum temperatures possible? Explosives like C4, however, create temperatures of 3000 degrees Fahrenheit, which easily melt steel. Why did Fire Engineering Magazine tell us that no steel building has ever been destroyed by fire, that the World Trade Center investigation was a half-baked farce. Why was all of the important evidence illegally destroyed, some before the investigation began? Why was $40 million spent to investigate Clinton's sex life while only $600,000 was spent on investigating the World Trade Center fires and subsequent collapse? Why did the entire 9-11 Commission spend only $15 million while expenditures on Clinton's lies exceeded $65 million? How could the airliner's impact have caused the collapse when wind gusts from storms had at times been greater than the impact of the airliners? Neither tower was bent, nor did they creak or groan at any time. Firefighters said they seemed sound and reported that there were no fires they couldn't control. How could the building collapse at the maximum speed of gravity? Each floor hit should have slowed the fall, just as if you drop a steel ball from the roof it would fall faster without resistance. This couldn't have happened without explosives placed inside the structure. How could the concrete encased in a steel framed pan with two layers of carpet over it, riveted inside columns of steel beams, welded together in a network with steel bands be pulverized? How could steel beams and clouds of finely pulverized concrete come shooting out of the buildings at hundreds of miles an hour, traveling all the way to New Jersey? This is only possible with explosives. The buildings fell rapidly, according to the 9-11 Commission, because the bolts, rivets, and steel framework were weakened by the fire. If so, then how could the concrete be pulverized and ejected at high speed since the force to do that is greater than the force needed to shear the weakened steel bolts and rivets. How could the Twin Towers fall straight down when the damage and resulting fires were only to one corner, two sides? Only the tops of the Twin Towers should have fallen, and they should have fallen over, not straight down. In fact, the top of one tower did fall over onto Building 4, so there was no building weight to crush the floors below. So what caused the collapse of those floors? How could a hijacker find and hit the Pentagon whose flight instructor said, I'm still to this day amazed that he could have flown into the Pentagon. He could not fly at all. How could a pilot this bad have the flight controllers comment, The steep turn was so smooth, it's clear there was no fight for control going on. The complex maneuver suggests the hijackers had better flying skills than many investigators first believed. 
Why did NORAD fail to stop the attackers four times on September 11, 2001? Three times after they knew the planes were hijacked and intent on mass murder. How could this happen when NORAD had successfully intercepted off-course and suspected hijackings 67 times during the year prior to 9-11, according to the Associated Press, on August 13, 2002? Why did Condoleezza Rice lie that the U.S. had no idea that terrorists would use hijacked airliners when Richard Cheney was commanding war games on 9-11, chasing phantom hijacked aircraft? Why were our Air Force planes diverted from intercepting the real hijacked airplanes? Isn't it too much of a coincidence that the four hijacked aircraft had only 20% of their seats filled, while all other transcontinental flights that day had 70 to 90% of their seats occupied? Why did the New York Times not publish the results of a Zogby poll, which showed that 66% of New Yorkers want the 9-11 investigation reopened? This poll also found that 49% thought that VIPs in the government knew ahead of time and let it happen. Thus, the final report does or will not answer many important questions and has many inaccuracies. Okay, well, during the last 14 shows, I've you know, presented all kinds of scientific evidence, maybe logical evidence, whatever. But it's always been a, a technical thing where, you know, you, you kind of have your choice of believing or not believing and without seeing the evidence yourself or whatever. It, it, I've shown you that the flight data recorders didn't match the official story. We played um, a clip from pilots for 911truth.org. Um, then we talked about Kevin Ryan, the whistleblower from NIST, who revealed that the steel was certified for 2,000 degrees at two hours, and it got less than 500 degrees, not 1,500, 500 degrees for 45 minutes, and that was supposed to make the tower collapse like that. I've shown you Richard Gage's presentation in two shows, one show on the World Trade Center 7 and the others on the the next show on the two towers uh, that's architects and engineers for 9-11 truth ae 911 truthorg I presented Brigham Young University's professor Stephen Jones discovery of thermate and iron rich microspheres in the debris um, you can reach him at scholars for truth and justice 9-11 that's stj 911.org I brought up the 700 bone fragments that were on the top of the Deutsche Bank building over two or 300 yards from the tower. How is it possible that jet planes were vaporized and yet human bones weren't, but not just found, they were found blown two, three football fields away. Gravity doesn't do that. I. I've shown you pictures of the 45-degree angle cuts. They used to be behind me on the, just earlier on this show. But, uh, you know, more evidence of controlled demolition. I've shown you Richard Siegel's 9-11 eyewitness doing an analysis of the building collapse at free speed, fall, you know, free fall speed. I've shown you the police and firemen warning of in, in, imminent catastrophic collapse. We heard testimony of the first responders, McPadden, uh, about hearing the countdown over the fire department's handheld radios. Three, two, one, run for your lives. And we've even got video of Amy Goodman running after they warned everybody to run. So Amy Goodman knows that it was controlled demolition herself because she was warned by the policeman that the building was coming down. Okay, thank you. I've shown Larry Silverstein's confession. They just mentioned it on that last uh, video. Well, go ahead, caller. Uh, yeah, I, I've, uh, I've got a question here for you. Sure. Hey, uh, it's a kind of a two-parter. I'll make it real quick. But uh, just how large do you think this thing is? Do you think this goes beyond this particular administration into, like, other nations and other 
administrations and uh, you think like you know is Europe involved? Is well, I don't Saudi think... Arabia involved or is Iran involved? I mean, how how big do you think this is? Well, let's first of all let's put it this way: it's not a national thing. I mean, it, it doesn't have anything to do with nations. It has to do with the elite and greed. Now they used our nation as a you know the way to do it. The pow- I guess they took advantage of the biggest military force. You can read a lot about that on the PNAC, PNAC website. That's Dick Cheney, Wolfowitz, Condoleezza Rice, all those folks signed a document that was like six or nine months, six about six months before 9-11 that called for taking over the world, basically, with our military might, using it against friend and foe, both not allowing friends to build up enough power to form an alliance against us and uh, they were brazen enough to leave it on the website but they they said that the changes that they call for would be slow in coming if they could come at all from the American public who would drag their feet uh, in the absence of a catastrophic event like a new Pearl Harbor that's almost a direct quote that's why um, the this book by David Ray Griffin uh, a new Pearl Harbor, that's where it got its title. The, uh, and Bush said right after 9-11, well, in his diary, supposedly, and I don't know who got to see his diary, but supposedly he wrote that it, today was a new 9-11. But there may or may not be rich Arabs from Saudi Arabia involved, but the, the patsies that the Federal Bureau of Investigation blamed for the attacks there's seven of them that are documented still alive and in jobs around the world so they were just names pulled out of a hat but I guess 19 hijackers, something like 16 of them were from Saudi Arabia Arabia, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean anything about who planned it but using the logic that they were Arab terrorists, we attacked Iraq, I mean uh, Afghanistan and then Iraq and uh, if you were going to really use that logic, wouldn't you start by going after Saudi Arabia, if anybody? You would think. Uh, so, but the I don't know. We don't know how big it is. It doesn't, you know, people say, well, wouldn't this involve thousands and thousands of people? No. It would only involve a small handful of really dedicated people that are dedicated to their own group, not to us or the Constitution. And the other people that had to be involved were involved without realizing what they were doing. They might have been doing military readiness drills that just flipped to live. That's what happened on 9-11, by the way. They had a series, like, I guess there's up to nine that they've identified now, nine drills that put false hijack blips on, on all the FAA's radars, and uh, then all the, one of the scenarios involved planes crashing into the World Trade Center towers that day, and the response group was already in their uh, response outfits the night before 9-11. They thought it was just a drill. Um, The second part of my question, what would you like to see happen to this administration after uh, these guys are are gone? Would you like to see an investigation opened up, impeachment, you know, know, an investigation of some sort with these guys? If we don't impeach the president and Cheney and his whole group before they leave office, and we probably won't see that because the Democrats and Republicans are, you know, kind of hand in hand with the corruption, not not in any of the planning or the wrongdoing. There's wrongdoing involved, but not about 9/11. What they all are doing is jumping on the slop at the public trough bandwagon. Um, 9/11 is the excuse to raise all the prices and start profiting like mad. Um, it's it's obs- obscene. Um, so everybody, like my dad said once when I was asking him about conspiracies, and he told me that it doesn't have to be a conspiracy if everybody has the same mindset. It's not really a conspiracy. They're just all ripping us off. And they're, you know, it doesn't matter who they kill as long as it isn't their friends, I guess. It almost seems like it's a uh, two two prong or three prong approach. With nine eleven, now we've got uh, the problems in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now we've got economic problems over here, energy crisis. It just it almost seems so 
calculated. Yeah, it is. And, you know, since you called, oh, eight minutes. I don't really have enough time to do that. I have a, a video that uh, talks about the false flag operations, not 9-11, but the ones leading up to 9-11 that the... Uh, the attempted bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993, which was masterminded by the FBI, and the FBI is caught red-handed because the Arab that they paid a million dollars to to, you know, be the sting leader to try to capture a bunch of idiot, some sort of idealist extremist types in the United States that might go along with some leader, and uh, the Arab was supposed to take live explosives from the FBI to, you know, give to these guys that would then use them on the the Trade Center Tower. Well, they didn't count on the Arab not being as ruthless as they were. And the Arab called up the FBI chief in New York and said, you don't want me to use real explosives, do you? And he said, yes, you you have to use that. And it, but the Arab was smart enough to have a tape recorder and the, I think it was the Associated Press ran an article one time on it, and then it disappeared from the screen. But that's the problem. We find out all this corruption, like the 35 articles of impeachment, and that's just the scratching the top of the, the, the heap. And we just sit there numb to it and let it keep going on. Um, and then we use Arabs as the excuse and, and start this Arab, you know, Christian Muslim thing where there really isn't that type of a problem, but we build it up in everybody's head, so they really look at it, they analyze it as that, instead of analyzing it as, you know, a move on the chessboard as we start fighting over resources on this planet. Hey, uh, well, <clears throat> thanks for uh, answering my questions, and I think you're doing a great job, and we'll talk to you later, okay? You bet, and I'm going to play a video now that might uh, open some eyes. It's, going to, it's a slow-motion, repeated video. I think... Well, it's on page three of, page three, number two is what I want in the control room there. It's a DVD cut. It, oh, got another call? Well, hello, caller. But go ahead and play that cut while we're, going, while we're talking. Is there a... Hi, and good day. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, first, thank you. This is the first time I've uh, seen your show, and thank you so much for giving us the um, proof positive uh, scientific documentation to uh, confirm what I've thought all along. Um, to the caller that uh, just um, spoke, I wanted to say I kind of think it goes back to Federalist Paper Number 10. Keep the factions separated. Keep us all fighting, and they'll keep power. The folks that have, um, have had power all along, uh, the, uh, from the monarchs to the folks that have the money, Right. Um, I, I, I thank you for your um, goodness. All the, and what is the name of your show, sir? Oh, it's Omega Presents. In Ome Omega Presents. Do you have a website? Uh, well, I have an email that's on the end of this, 251omega at comcast.net. Marvelous. And, Marvelous. Uh, I've been... Yeah, listening. you can contact me, but also all my videos I post on Google. So oh, divine. So you can see all 14 of them, and, uh, you know, some of them are seat of the pants, some of them are not so bad but anyway do you think that there's any correlation with the uh, I'm sorry do you think that there's any correlation with the dates involved in the and the fact that um, that the building was put up in uh, right around the same time that the peace accord in Palestine this is just an aside um, that the, I've always kind of the, uh, well that numerology I've heard a lot of people talking oh, about not necessarily numerology just the, the sheer coincidence of the um, well I I speculation again that the building was meant to come down that it had a unique structure oh it it was brought down because it was a, a you know a, a boondoggle they couldn't make any money on it nobody would go nobody would occupy it because it was an asbestos hazard it had little bitty windows that where the new modern buildings had lots of vision and um, the only reason that those buildings were still financially viable at all is that in the 70s uh, governor rockefeller moved all of the New York state offices into into those buildings and the rent paid their upkeep. Larry Silverstein admitted to bringing it down. You know, he made, just on when Building 7 fell, not, not counting the other two buildings, but Building 7 fell and he had put like $480 million into it and he got an 
and something million or I'm billion sure. million it, billion it, I don't know anyway yeah. he made it was four hundred billion dollars just by it falling it, exactly so it was m- worth more for them to uh, orchestrate this um, and I was I can't remember where I was listening to it but uh, oh the di- uh, uh, politics of disaster disaster politics oh yeah disaster uh, uh, what I can't remember the exact title but yeah Naomi Naomi right, Klein right exactly or, uh, Naomi, yes, yeah, so we, we know ex- I, yes, I, she was on, I think it was Tabitha Smiley. Yeah, and she, on. she is right on, what you can exactly. bet that whatever she says you could count on yes. being true. Exactly, and you know, I read a really good book, um, it, it was kind of a, it, it ta- I talked about Bohemian Grove, and it was called oh, yeah. the... Alex Jones. Exactly, yes, it, it, well, it, it was the, the, the BBC guy that was along with him, uh, when they went, actually got into the Bohemian Grove, and the book was called Them. Oh, he actually yeah. he um, he um, he did four different takes he, on extremism. Go ahead and play that video too behind me, will you? Oh oh oh! I would, I'd love to. I'm sorry. I I, I didn't realize. No, you I keep just, you, <laughs> you keep I watching. Went out of the room where the TV is. <laughs> oh okay. Well, I was going to have him play this video oh, of the collapse. Right. Well, thank you so much for. Yeah, we got two minutes, so get to your TV, and I'll, we'll try to put it in there. Thank you kindly, sir. Thank you, you kindly, and, and, and I'm looking for the website. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, and we'll be back on next Saturday. And it's it's with us getting together and talking about it and being Socratic um, uh, about the whole situation that we're going to fix it. The 9-11 Truth me- Movement's going to meet here next, the 19th. Right on. So come okay. on down on the 19th if you want to be part of it. Um, oh, oh, do you know I actually have the day off because my uh, my daughter's going to be out of town and I have my young son I would have a three year old with me but the more the merrier right that's fine with us marvelous and will that information be on your website it, as well it's on the end of this video here it's just about to start playing it now because we have one minute left super sweet I thank you again your name sir oh Bill Olson Bill yeah. Oakland as in oh there's my email they're going to put it in front of me so oh, that you beautiful. can see it hey right on I tried to get out of the way of it <laughs> Thank you. Well, you <laughs> exactly. Bet. I see you. Two five one omega. Yeah. Comcast dot net. Right. Right on. Hey, you thank you, Mr. <laughs> Oakland. I, I thank you so much. Oh, just call me Bill. Bill. But thank anyway, you. thanks. Hey, and you be have sure a good to day. call in next time. Thank you. <sighs>